Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us here in the Woodrow Wilson room for the 15th anniversary of ITW. It's my pleasure to welcome you. I hope you've had a fruitful and eventful time so far. So next up, we have a panel discussion uh, looking at how IoT, ICT infrastructure providers can support IoT deployments, which is part of the Future Networks track. So before we begin, though, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors, specifically our diamond sponsors, AT&T, Deutsche Telekom, STC, and Telefonica, for making all of this possible. Joining us now is a fantastic group of speakers, including our moderator for the panel, Charles Orsel de Sages, who is the principal managing partner, Amir and Latam at Cambridge Management Consulting. So without further ado, over to you, Charles. Be careful with the mic. So, good afternoon, everybody. Very happy to see you here again, three years after, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, very happy to see this very prestigious panel. So, here we have very an exciting topic to talk about: <laughs> I, IoT, how ICT infra providers can support IoT deployments. So. I would like, before starting, I would like each of you to introduce yourselves. I think you will do it much better than myself and position yourself in your company in one or two minutes. Maybe you want to start, Mahesh? Sure. sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, happy to be here. Sorry, I've just lost my voice a little bit, so... That's why I asked you to start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm the CEO of Arc Solutions. Uh, we are an infrastructure provider uh, out of Dubai and Bahrain uh, in the Middle East. Uh, we are a joint venture of Do and Batelco, two of the telecom operators, and we'll talk about our role as a platform for IoT. Great. Thank and you. And thank you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, Tom? Tom Turner. I'm uh, head of sales, uh, SVP of sales for uh, Rogers Communication. We're the, uh, the national provider in both wireless and wireline services solutions in Canada, and um, I get the pleasure of managing both the, the retail and the wholesale side of the business. Great. Thank you, Tom. Mikael? Hi, I'm Michael Wheeler. I'm with NTT. I head up our global internet backbone business. Um, and uh, happy to be here. Good to see everybody here at ITW this year. Great. Duan? Uh, Duan Young with Verizon, Verizon Partner Solutions, which is the global wholesale arm of Verizon. And good to see everybody. Great. Thanks a, thanks a lot. So if I may, I will read two sentences before, and then we'll ask starting some questions. So the introduction is that from fleet management to smart cities, we've seen IoT promises in our day-to-day -day life in our, and in our industries. But we know that many use cases need seamless and low latency connectivity. And telcos, we believe, are perfectly positioned through their networks and expertise to address those challenges. So in this context, I'd like to ask my first question. What has been the most adventurous thing you and your company have done this year? So maybe I will start with you, Duan. Sure, sure. So hanging out with 5,000 people after uh, <laughs> wearing sweats and uh, sitting on video conferences for uh, two years is pretty adventurous. But uh, you know, as a corporate uh, per, uh, level or perspective, you know, we've made significant investment in over $50 billion in spectrum, um, over $20 billion per year in capital investment in building our fiber, 5G, our fiber network, as well as preparing for 5G. So it is an adventurous undertaking for us to really, as we prepare for the promise of 5G, really support and look forward to what we're going to drive from an IoT perspective. So I think that's the most adventurous thing that we're, the journey that we're on right now. Okay, great. Mikael, what has been the most adventurous thing you've been doing the past 12 months? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'll actually uh, speak to something. So we, our probably biggest adventure in front of us right now is an announcement we did yesterday, which is uh, we're bringing together our entity data and our entity limited business, which is all the global 
uh, parts of NTT. And so it'll be a combination of two businesses that are roughly about the same size, about $10 billion in revenue each and 30 to 40,000 employees. And so in the context of your question, Charles, the, the interesting thing, I think the adventurous thing is that, um, you know, as an infrastructure provider, we certainly have done many things for, in general terms for infrastructure, but some of the applications and some of the use cases that we can really work work with entity data on going forward around uh, private 5G deployments, as well as a number of things around you know various IoT uh, examples like uh, we just launched some ESG specific uh, capabilities to drive usage from an enterprise perspective of that kind of a platform. So. You know, the coming together of our two companies is going to be a, an adventure, as it always is, uh, of that scale. But I think the actual benefits for the marketplace are those kinds of things that come out of that combination. Fantastic. Tom, what's your adventure? Well, I, I actually, I, I've, I, unfortunately, I have to copy a little bit of what my Why colleagues not? have said. The, fir <laughs> the first one is, is, five, uh, is 5G rollout. We were the first in Canada to roll out 5G. We've got the the largest 5G network in Canada. We cover about 70% of the population now with 5G. So that in and of itself is pretty significant with regards to this topic. But I think the secondary thing is we're just in the midst of uh, an integration ourselves with, uh, with Shaw. And so we're bringing sort of the two large cable codes together um, to ultimately provide the best and, and the, the largest network infrastructure company in Canada as well. So. The combination of those two things, I think, are, are going to be pretty powerful for, for enabling IoT in Canada. Fantastic. Amahesh? Uh, can I go off the record here? And kind of <laughs> yes, yes, of it? course. Yeah. We yeah. stopped the recording. I think the most, <laughs> the most uh, adventurous thing I did, and I'm not company-wise, I'll say personally that I did in the last 12 months is I went trekking in the Himalayas. Nice. So, so, that's what I wanted to hear. So, <laughs> so I, I, I'll... I'll not talk about what we did as a company, but I went trekking uh, to about 4,000 meters in, in Himalayas, and uh, I was thoroughly underprepared for it, and I just realized that uh, wow. uh, how much preparation matters, and, and, uh, uh, and I kind of take that to my, my the, the style of working, and I said, we need to prepare, 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 otherwise life becomes a struggle. So I make sure that every meeting I go to, I prepare very well. That's, that's, that's very impressive. I'm going off. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> Remember, my question was on your company or yourself. Yeah. So you did it. <laughs> Thank that's you. That's great. And as you say, you can apply that to our day-to-day -day life, but also our companies. And I say the IoT impact, remember, it's on the industry, on our day-to-day -day life as well. So this is, we are all concerned about this. At the end, it's a question of people, I would say. Yep. So, but we know that with these adventures, you need also some good partnerships to provide, to get those answers. So I'd like to ask you my next question. What do you see in terms of good partnerships in the market having an impact on your strategy? And maybe if I may add, whose partnership style do you admire? So maybe Mahesh? <laughs> okay, so uh, for IoT, so we are an infrastructure yeah, player. Yeah, in the IoT business. Of yes, so we are an infrastructure player and, and we have the core infrastructure. Uh, IoT is composed of three, as all of you know, three elements, the device, the connectivity, and the analytics. And yeah. uh, you can't do all the pieces yourself. So all of these pieces need partnership. So we partner with device manufacturers for the devices. Uh, the connectivity, as far as possible, is on our platform. And the analytics, there are much better companies than ourselves who build fabulous analytical tools. So we put it all together. So our USP lies in how well we put it together understand our customer's requirement and, and, and work together. So that's, that's where we as ARC come in. We look at what our customer's requirements are, what the devices they, they need, whether it's, it's 5G devices or it's narrowband IoT devices. Or, but the core piece that we have is the connectivity that we bring in, and, and we bring in an, a great analytical tool. Great. And Tom? Uh, not dissimilar. I, what, what we're really focused on is trying to, to create value for our customers. And what we're finding um, in the early days of IoT or data, it, w was, it wasn't overly complicated. There were very few applications, there were a few solutions, and if you focused and you picked the right ones, you, you did well. Um, today, what's happening with technology is it, it's, it's exploding into so many different areas. So. The, the challenge for us is to pick the right partners who are going to, to really sort of ignite that value with our customer base. And that's across multiple verticals. 
So it's not only finding the right partner, it's creating the right structure Absolutely. to to go to market jointly because I you know I agree completely we can't do it all ourselves so we bring the network we make we create access but to be what we're looking for are those partners that are bringing unique solutions for customers that that best highlight our, our network and you know we can go into a, a lot of conversation um, this afternoon about how do you how do you create those environments because to me that's really the the interesting piece um, verticals, segments, um, finding all of those right partners. And some are good today and then they're gone tomorrow. So yes. it's creating that ecosystem where people can, can easily engage with our clients is what we're focused on. Okay, that's great, thank you. Mikael? Michael, sorry. So, <laughs> either one. Uh, so I, I, you know, I think for me, if I reflect back and a little bit building on Dewan's point about two years, the last two years and what that's been like, and really taking I, IoT at the broadest level, um, the thing I, and I can be very critical of the industry at times, um, I think for good reason, but the, I, the thing I think that's been the most impressive is how well, from an internet point of view, the internet and the ability of, the capabilities of the internet worked in the previous two years, particularly the first three or four months when the pandemic first happened. There were some huge variations in traffic, huge spikes in traffic, and at the end of the day, at a tier one level, if we don't have good peering partner relationships, a lot of things really start to break down. And the uses that people you know, kind of had at a very short notice period of time around things like Zoom meetings, but certainly education, a number of other aspects of just day-to-day -day life would not have worked if we didn't have that, that infrastructure in place and didn't have that relationship in place to exchange traffic, to increase peering where it was needed, to do things very rapidly uh, for a very unforeseen circumstance. So I was asked this question earlier this morning in, a, in, a, in an interview, and I think to me the industry has done a very good job in that regard, and you know, kind of weathered I think the worst part of that storm at this point. But that's a I think I don't think we should be bashful to say that we you know work together well in that regard, and those partnerships are very important. Uh, I think from a, you know we don't think about that in some ways when we think about IoT as a very kind of specific use case or application driven environment, but at the end of the day it is the internet of things, and nothing works in that sense if you, the internet itself isn't working. So that's what I would kind of think to in the last, uh, last most recent history. Okay, and Duan? Sure, so, you know, from a Verizon Partner Solutions perspective, you know, our mission is to leverage the various assets within Verizon to grow the top line revenue of both our partners and of course Verizon. So I would double click on Mahesh's point. You know, IoT is based on the DNA of, of IoT, which is the device, the network, and the, ac and the applications. So for us, you know, we have the network component within IoT, but there's significant opportunity for partnership on the device level. How do you bring automation to the devices that are coming to your network? How do you certify more devices? How do you work with the OEMs in order to bring that from an IoT perspective and monetize that for IoT? And then from the application side, you know, as we drive more applications and more data and work through cloud, there's a significant opportunity to work with the, the various application providers to really bring synergies to that DNA. So it's not just the opportunity to provide the network component, but really a full suite of solutions. And then lastly, as you talk about modeling partnerships, we've had a significant movement within Verizon as it pertains to looking at partnership models. So, you know, we've modeled and we've partnered with AWS for MEC solutions as well as GCP. And then lastly, of course, Azure for both public and private MEC. And where that plays from an IoT perspective is as these endpoints and devices need more ultra low latency at the, you know, closer to the edge, you know, it all fits well together. So, you know, it's a full solution, but I think partnership at the, at the core of it uh, is a key component as to how we figure out how to monetize and accelerate and scale at a higher level. That's brilliant, I mean, thanks. Um, I'd like to speak now, uh, ask a question about the big trends, the key big trends that we see. Uh, I'd like to have your opinion on those. And actually, I'd like to ask you also what's the most exciting development you've, been, you've seen in the market. And maybe to give you one or two examples. Uh, how IoT is changing the traffic and latency demands on networks, on how new, for example, new satellite constellation empower rural IoT uh, solutions. So on how do you see the impact of IoT network architecture? So what big trends do you see on the market right now? Maybe, Mahesh? 
I, I think the, f the one thing that we are seeing is that there is an expectation from the customers for a kind of a, a Lego-like uh, architecture to IoT, which means that these are blocks that they can take and, and kind of fit it together and create uh, environments for themselves. So we are seeing that uh, as one of the trends. The second trend that we are seeing is a lot of focus on security. I think yes, uh, to us, yeah. in IoT, I think the, the customers are demanding and justifiably so concerned about uh, security because there are hundreds and thousands of devices out there connected to their networks and, and access to um, cameras and, uh, and sensors and all of that is, is sensitive information. I think there is a lot of uh, attention uh, being given to security. And I think that is a key trend that we are seeing. You went to, you're talking about security, you're talking as well about cyber security. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. I, I'm talking Absolutely. about cyber security itself, actually. Yes, Sorry. certainly. Yeah. Yeah. And Tom? Yeah, I, I think there's a, a few things that are, that are happening. Number one, I, I look at it in, in terms of, of whether it's critical IoT or, or this massive IoT trends that are happening. And, and critical is so dependent upon the latency of the network. And, yes, and that's That is a, I mean, that last panel was really talking about architecture and what yes. you need to deliver that. Um, but that's one piece. The other is the absolute scale of the demand for devices and applications. But what, when you fold that back and you, you start to actually look at the customers, they're all very, very different and have very, very different use cases. So to me, it's the, ver it's the specialization of IoT that's happening now, to me, that is the most interesting element of it. Because you can't just put your finger on one thing and say, that's IoT. It's absolutely everything, whether it's agriculture. Um, you've got devices that are out there measuring uh, moisture in, in the soil. And it's different on one side of the hill than it is on the other. Uh, yeah. You're thinking about autonomous vehicles and mining devices and private LTE networks, all very, very different applications and solutions. And to be able to articulate that value proposition in the terms um, of the clients are so very different. So all of this concept about trends and specialization and um, partnership, it is all interwoven. And then, of course, you can't separate it from the network. So it's a very complicated soup, so to speak. And, uh, and exciting. It's very exciting. <laughs> That's challenging. Cool. And challenging. We'll speak about challenges as well. Michael? Yeah, for us, the trend that we've seen probably the most, that's the most dramatic, is video. Now, if I had answered this question eight or ten years ago, it would have been streaming video. It would have been people watching and downloading movies, looking at TV shows, um, even watching maybe you know uh, uh, live live sports events or whatnot. Mm -hmm. but the reality now, and in the last 18 to 24 months, it's been the whole you know Zoom Teams, you know those kinds of video exchanges because yeah. the latency requirements are dramatically different. You're looking at interactivity in a full-fledged way as opposed to just uh, downloading something where you can have some buffering, you can take some more yeah. time. Um, that expectation from a user perspective, whether it's a, a business user or a consumer user, is dramatically different. And so from an infrastructure point of view, we have to be sensitive to that kind of latency demand. Um, I mean, we, we use Teams a lot internally as a, as a business, and regularly the, at the end of the Teams call, I see the screen pop up, you know, how is your video quality? And you rank it, yeah. you know, with the stars, right? So that's, a, that's not something that's just, oh, we think we did pretty good. There's active engagement, understanding how was that experience for somebody in that environment. And, you know, I think that's what we are really seeing from, from users. Our customers who are video, uh, you know, conferencing providers like that are, have seen really huge amounts of traffic growth in a volume perspective, but the latency component of that is a whole different dynamic than it used to be, let's say, again, eight, ten years ago when it was just streaming or downloading uh, movies to watch at home. That dynamic's very different. I think from a customer experience point of view, the expectation only continues to get higher because you're not only looking at video, but you're sharing an application, you're you know, co-working on a presentation or a file, and that also has a latency component to it as well. So th those kinds of things are things we're seeing, and I think we'll see more and more of that going forward. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Duan. Sure. So I'll double click on something both Tom and Mahesh said. You know, Tom you know, mentioned you know, at the core of this is the customer and their end users. So I think from a trend perspective, what's been most exciting is to see how customers are actually using <coughs> sensors, cameras, and we probably the most overused utilized term is digital transformation, but it's true. 
we're transforming the way that we do business and we're transforming the way we live, right? So everything from, you know, most of the time on social media, it's somebody's uh, a ring camera that is posted on social media on something, but we've changed the way that we're entertained and that we do things. So everything with IoT is new and exciting. I think from the point that Mahesh made, I think from a security stance perspective as we look at IoT, you know, we have, we are undergoing a significant change in the framework of security or cybersecurity, right? So everything was proximity-based security, right? So if I'm on this side of the firewall, I'm bad. If I'm on this side of the firewall, I'm good, right? But with zero trust network access or ZTNA, yeah. it's I don't trust anything, right? So everything has to claim why it should be on the network why it should be doing whatever it's doing. And I think that framework is changing. And as we look at IoT and the endpoints, as we continue to proliferate more and more endpoints, you know, using things like ZTNA in order to you know, provide our partners with an end-to-end -end framework for security that protects them from the, all of this proliferation of endpoints and devices, I think becomes unique and an opportunity for us. So that's, those are the trends that we're working on, and how do we put that together for partners in a, in a, in a way that you know, both protects their, their networks, but also their end users. So those are some of the trends that we're seeing. Super, thank you. And um, yes, security, cybersecurity, with all those connected devices which are skyrocketing. rocketing, I mean, yeah. cybersecurity is essential more and more today. Uh, you talk about customers, Duan, so I'd like to continue with you. Uh, what do your customers want more than anything else? And as a consequence, have you planned or programmed to make some change on your products and solutions? Yeah, our customers want everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you want well, to do it? Can you do everything? <laughs> I, if I were to simplify, you know, what our customers are truly looking for, I would say three things. They're looking for, as it relates to IoT yes. specifically, um, you know, they're looking for global, simple, secure solutions, right? So what's fascinating about the conversations as you walk through the halls today it's, and the GLF and all of the things that we're doing is really about how do we work together, interoperability um, amongst the carriers so that it's not just about providing IoT for our network, but our customers truly are mostly multinationals and global co corporations. So how do you provide an end-to-end -end solution from a global perspective on IoT? And then the second piece is simple. You know, that's not always a synonymous term with us, but you know, the ability to bring frictionless processes in a simple way across networks is a critical piece. And then I just, I just talked about secure. As we add more and more endpoints you know, and have more and more threats, nobody wants to be on the news for some cybersecurity breach um, from that's an true. end user perspective. So that's what I would say. They're looking for global, simple, secure solutions. Good, and Michael? So I would, I would certainly jump on the global piece of it. I think, you know, from, uh, yes. from our point of view, um, you know, our value proposition and certainly what our customers expect from us is a global offering and global opportunity in that regard. So that's certainly uh, common. I, I would add, though, I think that, you know, the reality is if, if we're, you know, really being candid, I mean, customers want cost-effective solutions as well. Yes. I mean, telecoms in general terms are always under some level of, of margin, you know, compression, margin pressure, and as businesses, I think, you know, that's something that we always have to kind of deal with, is how do we manage our cost structure which usually involves things like employing more and more automation, doing things that are cost, you know, drive, help drive OpEx and those kind of costs down, uh, as well as even on a CapEx level too. But, so I would say global cost effective, and I think reliable. I mean, our customers certainly um, are, you know, happy when they feel like they can trust us to deliver the service we've committed to deliver for them. And so that reliability is key, especially when you have large scale network events, you have large scale DDoS attacks, security, you know, network security events, those kinds of things. It's important from a customer's point of view that we can still deliver to them the service that we've committed to deliver. And I think, you know, that's certainly what we endeavor to do. Okay, thanks. And Tom? Yeah, I, I would maybe be a bit contrarian in, in the, the need for global. Um, I mean, they think that's what we do in the, in the back end. Uh, we bring that power to bear for our customers. But our, our customers are they want local, they want to know, they want to talk to that quote unquote trusted advisor, someone that can, it can help them through the process of, of trying to, to create value in an area that traditionally they haven't been involved in. So in many cases, they're looking for an expert who can help them navigate all of the options and explore what's possible. 
Um, they're all trying to do the same thing. They're trying to reduce cost, improve efficiency, um, de-risk their business, uh, increase revenue. So what we're trying to do are create environments that make it easier for them. And then when they make that purchase decision, you know, the comment about frictionless, it's really got to be mm -hmm. easy. We can't make them jump through hoops. So I, I think in many cases, because this is such a new territory, our customers are really looking for help, and that's, that's incumbent upon us to, to deliver that. Okay. Perfect. Mahesh. I would echo Dwayne's point. I think the customers want simplicity. So every customer wants it to be extremely simple, and the other thing they want it is to be transparent. They don't want it to be in their face. They want it to kind of blend in to what they're doing. So uh, I think it's a combination of it and, and to what Tom also said, that customers are looking for it to be simple and kind of standardized, ubiquitous, out and in, 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 in disappear, just completely transparent to them. So they don't, they want security. They don't care if you have security cameras, you have doors that have access sensors, everything, but they just want the end product, the, the, the benefit of it. Okay. It also depends on, on who the customer is. Sure. Because That's true. Some, some customers are incredibly sophisticated and others are, are very novice in the space. So if you're selling to General Motors or you're selling to a, a mine who's running, you know, autonomous vehicles, uh, you know, three miles in the ground, they're much different than, you know, the local dry cleaner, so to speak, who's Absolutely. looking for, for, for technology to help them, uh, you know, compete against the, the, the dry cleaner down the street. So I, th I think it really depends on who the customer is, too. I agree. Yeah. Any other comments on that? No? You agree? Okay. So let's talk about growth. So what, what are the main uh, influencing growth factors in your market for, for IoT? Maybe I start again with you, uh, Tom. Um, well, for us, it, 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 is, it starts with the network. Mm -hmm. So having the capabilities of the network and then having all of the applications, bringing the applications to bear. So I think that, that's what's stimulating the growth in the marketplace is you, you, you create the speeds and the low latencies and the capabilities and then you're seeing the market respond to customer needs. More and more applications, more and more solutions are creating a greater need. Um, one of the things that, that that's causing us to think about, which is really sort of how do you, how do you ignite that growth is we're, we're always working on what's our go-to-market model. So how do we enable the market with experts that are appropriate? Um, you know, as I said, every customer is, is not created equal. So um, having an expert in automotive who is going to engage in that every single day is much different than someone who's trying to um, ignite local market IOT because there, there, there are people that are creating unique applications all over the you know in every city in, in every in every country so how do you support that environment and also support a, a major automotive manufacturer completely different market yes. models so we're tr we're constantly tweaking with how do we support the market and uh, we don't have it right yet I mean, we were it's it's a constant evolution I would say okay good Dwayne, for you on the, for Verizon. Yeah, so it's interesting. The um, Tom made an interesting point around you know a lot of what we do is behind the scenes. The customer doesn't really want to understand how everything is made. They just want to you know simple on the front end. And the other point is that every customer is different, right? And the, and the way that they interact with us is different. So, you know, as we look at automation and orchestration and portals that are simple to use that meets the customer exactly where they are, I think that becomes a critical point. I think one of the things that's been interesting with the pandemic is that it did accelerate digital transformation as to now people are used to doing business in different ways, mm -hmm. in simpler ways that, you know, businesses may have not accelerated that if it wasn't forced upon them by the pandemic. So I think there's opportunity there so that we can, you know, mirror that as, as we continue to evolve from an IoT perspective, some of that transformation, some of that ease of use, some of that frictionless uh, automation that, that people are used to now and actually, quite frankly, demand 
right? So they want to, to work with you in an easy to use way. And I think we as carriers and we as providers have to meet customers where they're at regardless of their size or scope or, or scale. Uh, Michael? Yeah, I think for, for us, I would focus more probably on the internet part of this versus the things part of this you know, section. Yeah. But you know, from an internet point of view, the growth we're seeing really over the next you know, year to two years is moving from 100 gig to 400 gig and, and that kind of volume of capacity. I mean, internet centric businesses that we work with, um, there, there are varieties of, to, to both my colleagues' points, that varieties of applications, variety of, of needs that customers might have. And that's, for us, that's not really the, the space we're specifically focused on. We're focused on making sure we deliver the traffic that they have wherever they need to have it delivered with a consistency. Um, so I'll, I'll take uh, kind of the opposite of the, the, the global conversation a little bit with Tom and to say, for our customers, when they're connecting to our autonomous system, they want to have the same set of BGP tools, the same set of capabilities, whether it's in London, Singapore, Seattle, you know, Tokyo, it doesn't matter. That's what they're looking for from a global consistency perspective. And so that's the things, you know, those are the things we're focused on delivering for them. But it's really at a at more of a bulk or a, a large scale internet point of view, um, not so much at an application specific level. But all those applications, you know, right over it. I was in Singapore a few weeks ago and uh, we got to the hotel, we checked in, we're going to the office, and I went to order up an Uber and the Uber isn't in Singapore, you know, which is a, kind of a new, I didn't know that, right? So then I'm kind of trying to figure out why to get a taxi. What I do. Well, there, apparently there's a, another group called Grab, then you do that. So they're basically the Uber of Singapore. And so I was able to download the application, upload my credit card, order a car within less than 10 minutes. And that's an Internet of Things application in my mind that was very cool and local to a certain extent, mm -hmm. right? I don't know if there are any other markets besides Singapore, but that solved a real term problem for me in a very short period of time. But having an experience that you can, whether, you know, here, I was able to get an Uber, which was nice, you know, <laughs> something that I, that I knew uh, from the airport. But, uh, you know, whatever it is, like, having that, that consistency of experience, I think, is what customers, whatever customer use case it is, are looking for. And that's where we're kind of driving our, our activities around that, that large-scale internet, you know, service set that, that people require. Yeah, you're right. Consistency is key because um, you can be very happy at certain times, and but then if it drops, it's finished. It's like the trust, you know, to build a trust takes time, right. but you can drop it in one second. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Mahesh, with your point of view? Uh, being from the Middle East, uh, our biggest growth sector has been the energy sector. Mm -hmm. So we see energy uh, production, uh, uh, dispensing, metering, uh, all of it has been the biggest growth drivers for us uh, in the IoT segment. So. I think that's for us the key, I, and, and I think for them it's it's far easier to build a business case and justify all the expenses for that. It, the recovery, the ROI is far better uh, for the energy sector, and they kind of are leading into for for other industries, other verticals uh, to use uh, use IoT. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I told you that I was going to talk about challenges, so. Um, I'd like to ask you and start with you, Mahesh, which challenges are you most excited to face now? <laughs> okay, the, cha the challenge we face is something that Tom talked about that, and, and I think Dwayne also um, mentioned it, which is that every use case is different, every customer is different. Mm. And so there isn't an approach that's kind of transposable to every customer or something that you can cookie cutter have an approach to everything so we find that there is a lot of time that is required in developing solutions and and rolling it out for every customer so hence the the opportunity has to be large enough to to justify that kind of a, uh, that kind of a spend of time and energy into it so that's that's the challenge that we are facing right now but I'm, I'm sure this would kind of um, more and more cases come in and I think we would have a library of cases of which we can start uh, developing okay great and Tom um, um, I would agree. Those are that, that is the challenge. Um, it, this is such a bifurcated market, but also it, it translates into people for me. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is such a fast-growing and demanding industry um, that if you t develop and train people up, they're they're quickly sucked up sucked up by the market. They just disappear quickly. So. Um, Finding the right people who have that expertise is very difficult, and then keeping them. So, to me, um, you know, at the end of the day, people make the difference, at, 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 and, and they're the ones that are going to create value in, in those relationships, whether it's the, the major enterprise and the global 
um, accounts that you're talking about, or it's it's local. So we're we're focused on one, what are the right models that we put our people in, and then two, finding the right people to fit into those roles. So I would think that that for us is one of the challenges. But do you believe that finding the right people, um, the comp the difficulty comes where? From a shortage of resources or from the lack of motivation, from the post-COVID situation that people <laughs> change their way of working? What no, it's not, it's not short of, uh, short of a motivation. It, it's, it's demand. This area demand. is growing so rapidly mm. that when you develop any form of expertise, you're immediately started to be headhunted for other roles. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's a it's, demand. it's a pretty true demand. Yeah, it's a yeah. demand-driven demand. market, and that yeah. that's on the people and on on the industry side. Okay, on the Michael. Yeah, so I, I would add, I would agree with Tom 100%. I think staff and and you know associates in the organization, keeping retaining and growing them is one of the biggest challenges. I guess an industry we face mm -hmm. kind of holistically, and I do think that's a very market-driven dynamic. And I don't think the current market dynamics, at least what I see in the U.S. and and Europe are going to last for forever. I mean, just the unemployment rates are at you know record record lows, and that won't always be true. Um, so I think it'll be the pendulum will swing back a little bit. The I guess the slightly not to, to repeat the exact same thing Tom already made the good point of, but uh, and I don't know that I'm excited to deal with this. Just to be clear, but <laughs> it's something that we have to deal with as a business is uh, supply chain issues. I mean, really. The pandemic has really had some massive impact on supply chain in a number of different ways, at a number of different levels. And the only, I mean, the concern I have at this point is we're two years into this and it really isn't resolved. So nobody, I think, would expect that those issues would pop up and be resolved in a month or two, two years ago. But the fact that there are a number of still, uh, you know, long-term time-driven issues around delivery of certain aspects of the infrastructure, we talk about infrastructure, that's a problem, and I think it, not just us as an industry, but the technology industry at whole really needs to, I think, figure that out and put a little more emphasis on it because it's not resolved yet. And I think it's everything I can see and in, in talking with other folks like at the GLF yesterday, you know, it, it, these aren't things we think are going to be solved in the next six months. They, they could linger for another at least couple of years. I think that's a wake-up call for us as an industry. I mean, we have to mm -hmm. do some things differently around supply chain. You know. You, that are maybe not comfortable, but something that we're going to have to try to figure out. So I don't look forward to the challenge, but it is a challenge. No, no, we no, have no, to, no. <laughs> to attack, that was an attack. option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Duane. So uh, you know, I don't disagree with Mahesh or Tom or Michael on this, but I, in the spirit of not being completely redundant, <laughs> um, because I mean, I, I think going first. it yeah, does. Exactly. <laughs> you guys like one by one took each of my. Uh, <laughs> Answers there. The um, but I think to, to Mesh's point about the opportunities, Tom's point about people and the, the resources, and then of course Michael around supply chain. You know, if I were to kind of give a macro answer to this, I would say that it's really for me on a personal level is the realization in one word, right? So I had the opportunity to sit on this panel about five years ago when we were in ch Chicago. Same panel about IoT, and we talked about, you know, IoT, the total addressable market, the number of connections, and pretty much everything we talked about five years ago. But really delivering on the promise of IoT of as it relates to really monetizing it and bring it to market and, and addressing everything that we just talked about. How do you realize that? How do you monetize IoT in a way that, you know, the market is called, analysts have called for, um, for years now. So I think that's the, the thing that probably keeps me up at night of, is, you know, really delivering on the promise of IoT because, you know, there's a million panels and there's a million analysts talking about this, but we're as a, a community, we really got to deliver on it. So I, I think that's that's where I would say. I can't bang on. I mean, every, <laughs> every day we fight to try to make sure that we're delivering. I, I think of the business in form of gears, and you got big gears and you got little gears. And right now, IoT, we all know it's going to ultimately be huge, but from regards to revenue generation and. and customers. It's a small gear. I yeah. mean, the bigger gears take all of the attention yeah. and, and oxygen out of the room. So how do you grow this without, you know, yeah. without losing your track of, of your core business? So And have the patience to grow it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. Okay, I, I see that we have two questions here, and we'll try to read them. So how do you see video collaboration integrating into future IoT solutions? 
and second one completely different. How do you plan to address the network security issues created by IoT-enabled devices? Who wants to pick that one, one of the two? I'll pick the second one, actually. I, okay. I, honestly, I, I, I've had to talk about this before on uh, previous panels um, as well, but I mean, the, the reality is, is that some of the biggest network security events that we see come down to basically just people not managing passwords and security on very well called dumb IoT devices, just static devices that are being used but have an IP address or have access to an IP address and you know they, they don't get managed correctly. I, I honestly believe it's actually uh, on the regulatory bodies on a worldwide level and the manufacturers to do a better job of requiring in the software that's on those devices to have a password update occur on, a, on some kind of a regular cycle so that those can't just be used as, as weapons in regards to kind of taking down large scale you know, network attacks. We've seen it a lot in a number of different instances. It's very well documented. Everything from routing devices to cameras to doorbells to all kinds of things that are just, they, they serve a purpose and it's a great part of the IoT story, but they're just being used in many ways across the board that they shouldn't be and the connections that sit behind them. So from my point of view, um, that, that one is really on hardware and manufacturers in particular uh, and even regulatory groups. I think they can do much more uh, to, to help minimize those kinds of attacks. Also, though, I, I agree with you. It, it, again, it depends on the type. So if you think about really low latency, high demand autonomous vehicles, things like that, it's really incumbent that you put that security within the network. It, 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 it can't go down. Yeah, I'm not saying the network doesn't have an obligation as well. I'm just saying that when you talk about devices that are being essentially utilized in a way they're not intended to be utilized, that to me is the risk. But it's an for sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, who wants to pick up the, the second one, the video? I can take a stab at it. <laughs> I wasn't exactly sure what they were asking on that. Yeah, question. I was going to go any directions. I didn't know either. So, you know, Verizon purchased a company called Blue Jeans during mm -hmm. the pandemic. And, you know, our, my colleagues from the Blue Jeans team are here uh, today. Um, and they are really looking at video to integrate, disrupt in so many different ways. So, just take an example of healthcare. So, what can we do from a telehealth perspective? So, when you talk about video collaboration, how do you use, you know, video conferencing in a way that, you know, changes the way that medicine and healthcare happens? Or something like re uh, uh, remote patient monitoring, you know, how do you use solutions and IoT in a way that you, you haven't in the past? So, I think video collaboration, there's an opportunity for us to change the way that we do business in a lot of different ways excuse me, a lot of different ways Be beyond, you know, what we see on TikTok and, and social media. There's <laughs> opportunities there to really look at verticals and industries and segments and say, is there a different way that we could use that? Or is there a way that we can bring video into that and change the way that we do it? So I think IoT solutions are evolving and video uh, to the points that we've, we've made has an opportunity. I, I think video will always play it. It's been amazing to be face to face with everybody, yes. you know, and not be on video conferencing for once. But I think as we have more and more applications, you know, that incorporate video, I think you'll, you'll, you'll see that more and more. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the, the where, where I was thinking, it, it's an interesting question. Um, using, using IoT to recognize things like faults and failures in, in operating systems, whether it be the John Deere tractor in, in an agro environment, and then sending somebody out who has a sense for what the problem is, but then using video and things like that to do on-site. So they're having conversations with the expert who doesn't necessarily have to be in the field. They can be back, um, you know, wherever they, they may be, Toronto or wherever. Yeah. Um, it is the center of, of, of North America. <laughs> I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, the other, and Tom makes an interesting point there, I think, you know, as, as you look at technician visits or, or technicians or training or things of the like, you know, there's an opportunity to, yeah. you know, you know, it may be provocative, but, you know, I don't really get the metaverse or virtual reality at all. But I do see use cases for augmented reality where you can train people on how to do something. Can you do a, a ride along or a tech visit where somebody can see and you can really have training materials. So I think there's a multitude, whether it's training or other opportunities to bring video into IoT. And as we see wearables and head, headsets and, and the like come into market, I think we'll, we'll see, you know, what the, the, the true future of all of this stuff is. That's, 
that's great. Um, thanks a lot. That's great. So we have four more minutes. So I would propose that one minute each, if that's fair, for my last question, uh, which is actually very easy. What keeps you awake? <laughs> and how do you keep focus in this uh, VUCA world? So what keeps you awake? Maybe, Dwayne, you want to... Okay. Now I start. Now when I'm not ready, yes. <laughs> 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 you have just one minute. <laughs> like, from there, I, I think, you know, our, our president, Eric Stevens, said something in the keynote today. And I think it's apropos to IoT, but, you know, um, the rearview mirror is smaller than the windshield for a reason, right? So we can look back, but there's so many opportunities in front of us that we need to capture. And actually figuring out how to capture and monetize all this stuff, I think, is, is what keeps me up at night. Okay. Yeah. Um, Michael, you know that question. What keeps you awake? <laughs> yeah. So I would echo what I, I said earlier that actually right now the supply chain issues are the things that are the most concerning. Um, they really are, are creating some challenges that are not simple challenges to solve. It isn't just writing another piece of software or, or you know, deploying some new product or whatever. It's actually really critical to the infrastructure, again, as, as kind of the underlying component here. So that's currently that's the case. That may not hopefully be the case forever, but it is right now. Okay, great. And Tom? Uh, to me, it's balancing um, the, the, the revenue generation that's coming out of IoT with the need for investment and, and investing in such a broad um, arena to, mm. to, to create this market. So um, it's, it's trying to figure out those, those go-to-market models, to me, that are, are what keeps me up at night. Okay. And you, Mahesh? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's the... <clears throat> the huge array of opportunities that are there to point to when talking about with new technologies, metaverse or blockchain or NFTs and, uh, and we are making bets on some of them and, and you think, am I doing the right thing? And, and, and will some of them pay off and some won't? And, and so, yeah, so that's, that's what keeps me awake, uh, saying so many opportunities, all look good, but you have to make a bet on a couple of them or a few of them. And, whether that's the right one. Okay. So, so a big thank you to the four of you for this fantastic yeah. panel. And uh, I'm sure you're doing the right things, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Charles, for the expert moderation, and to Dewan, Mahesh, Michael, and Tom for their time and for their insights. I want to... Head off. I'd once again like to thank all of our sponsors for their support. Of course, without them, this isn't possible. Um, and our next session, starting in about 10 minutes at 4 p.m., is a panel exploring 5G with speakers from Zenfi, Neutrality, Spiron, and Deutsche Telekom. So please hang around and join us for that. Thank you very much.